Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Battle of Ontario Hockey Podcast, featuring a Senators fan and a Leafs fan. We're here to talk about your two favorite teams, the rest of the NHL, local hockey, hockey all around the world, and to bring back memories from your favorite hockey teams and players. If you love the Leafs, Sens, B-Sens, NHL, or any other hockey, including the late Belleville Bulls, you are going to want to tune into our podcast. The gloves are off, the buckets are spinning, let's get the chirps flying. Welcome to the Boo Club! Hey guys, welcome into episode 6 of season 2 of the Battle of Ontario Hockey Podcast. I'm Flem. Uh, Mr. Senators over there is Mr. Jeffrey Brokema. So we're recording on a Sunday here, trying something different, Brokey, trying to uh, recap Saturday night. So how's it going, buddy? Did you uh, enjoy your Saturday night? Big win for the Senators and uh, and the B-Sens last night too, right? Well, it's the first time, in, and I want to say about a week or two, probably two, close to two weeks where I haven't been grumpy, staring at the TV, <laughs> watching the Ottawa Senators play. Uh, actually, yeah, it's been uh, over two weeks, I think. So uh, Ottawa finally won, which was uh, – Good, considering uh, all the circumstances that have gone on with that team the last uh, week or so, eh? And then Belleville won, too, which is another surprise because they had, I believe, eight regulars out. So, you know, they were calling guys up uh, left, right, and center from the East Coast, it seemed like yesterday yep. um, and the day before. So it was uh, definitely interesting. But sometimes when you're back against the wall, um, you know, uh, you're going to get some extra work out of guys because they know they have to or mm -hmm. they're going to be embarrassed. And, uh, you know, if you get a bouncer to your way, I mean – Looking at the Ottawa game, just the last few games, it's parts of the games they just couldn't find a bounce, you know, especially the game before there where they lost 2-0. Um, they, they, it could have easily been 2-0 Ottawa, right? So it was just a back-and-forth game. And you know how it is, right? That's how the Leafs kind of – they kind of got screwed last year in the playoffs, right? They just couldn't get a bounce. Um, I think it was game six. They were out shooting Montreal like 12-1 and or 12 nothing. I think it might have been in, in overtime. Montreal yep. goes down to scores, right? So, yep. I and mean, that's hockey, though. That's the sport, and that's why they, they play it. So, we've got lots to go on about today, guys. Um, so, it should be a good show. And we do have a guest that we're going to have on, but we'll bring him on uh, later on in the show. So, uh, where do you want to begin, buddy? You're, you're at least you're on a little bit of fire right now, and they, and they ended up beating Buffalo last night. I was rooting for Buffalo, but Buffalo couldn't get it done. Yeah, so uh... – <laughs> The Leafs come out this weekend back to back, and they do pick up two wins. You know they uh, they do beat Calgary and Buffalo, uh, play the backup goalie in both games. But uh, you know, just kind of after really watching both games, dissect them, I wasn't extraordinarily happy with the Leafs play. And there was a couple reasons why. You know, I don't mean to sound too negative about the situation, but I just really think, kind of as the team sits, I think the last couple of games have really shown me why this team loses in the playoffs. I mean, you just have silly little plays in the defensive zone or in the offensive zone too but just things that make your life more difficult. And I think I've said this a couple of times, but the thing that drives me crazy about the most about this team is their reluctance to ever give up the puck to the other team, especially inside their own zone. If you look at the game against Buffalo last night, they're up 4-3 and Buffalo just scores. And then the Leafs have the puck probably at the top of the circle. And it's an easy chip off the glass and out. It's an easy play, but no, Tavares passes it back. I think it was to Dermott. And then you go back in, you get in trouble in your own zone. And then 30 seconds later, the team scores. If you just chip that puck off the glass and take the easy play, you're not in that situation. You can regroup. You can trap coming in through the neutral zone and through the blue line. It's just a team that just – this is obviously the system they have set up. It's, it's how Keith wants to play. It's how Dubas wants to play. It's their philosophy of never giving the puck up. And that just comes back to bite them. Sometimes you just got to think of it in terms of a worst-case scenario. Like, what's the worst case happens? If I flip it out and it goes to the neutral zone, sure, maybe they have the puck for 30 seconds, but we can play – we can keep to the outside – and we can get a face off and get the puck back. Or we take the puck back in our own zone, we get in trouble with it, we start running around, and they score 20 seconds later against a backup goal in his first game. So to me, these games really kind of showed the problems with the Leafs and, uh, and just, just why they're probably not going to win is they don't make it easy on themselves, and I don't think that's uh, trending that way to do that. No, and, and you stole the words from me uh, there. I was going to say that's the system they they play they're a puck possession team they don't want to give it up they don't want to be chipping in and as a fan I mean obviously in this situation it's a little bit aggravating but as a fan sometimes that's awesome because I'll tell you when I watch Ottawa a lot of times and I'll get into it later but I hate giving away the puck when you don't have to now having said that in certain situations when you're late in the game and you're up by a goal 
I mean, you have to learn to change your game. That can't be just every time we're going to hold on to the puck, no matter what, we have to have puck possession. I think when it comes down to it, there's got to be certain situations. Maybe 90% of the game you play that way. But when it comes, you know, the last five minutes or whatever, the end of the game, change your style. And I think yeah. you're going to – the only way they're going to win or any, anybody else is going to win is if you can adapt to the type of game – or not the type of game, but the game you're in. The game inside the game. So, you know, I'm up a goal. I'm down a goal. I'm, you know, we're even, whatever the, whatever the case is, mm -hmm. um, it's first minute of the period or it's last minute of the period or last minute of the game or whatever. I mean, you have to adapt and that's part of coaching. Um, so if you're five minutes left in the game, how much time was left in that play? Sorry. I didn't, it was about I five minutes left. About, right, right okay, five there. minutes left. I mean, that's when the coach, when he's got to be saying, listen, let's get pucks out. Everything's got to be out. Let's yeah. not worry about possession right now. Pucks in deep, no turnovers, let's get out of this game, right? And some, sometimes it's not always about the numbers. I think that's the thing. And that's what you see in different sports. Like in baseball, if you get into late into a baseball game, like the seventh inning, and sometimes if the numbers say this guy may hit it here, but what's the worst case scenario about position right here? Maybe he gets a single. Well, if I move over here and I guard the lines, that's what a lot of people do in baseball. Is they guard the lines come late innings. So you don't get a double or a triple, and that runs coming in to score, right? So I don't know. Weird comparison to baseball. I don't know how I went there. But just, uh, I don't know. Yeah, like you said, it's just got to, you got to, and it's got to be who you are too. Like if Austin Matthews is uh, if Austin Matthews wants to take the puck back, I'm a little more willing to accept that as opposed to a guy like Pierre Ingvall or someone like that. Like, you know, I just know who you are. Like if you're not the most capable guy with the puck, just chip the fucking puck out and live to fight another day. It's not even like it happens all the time where they take the puck down and score just because they hold the puck. I mean, silly little plays that they're making. And I just think that's, that's just the main reason that they're, they're not going to win in the playoffs. And, Maybe that's something that's not going to change until someone like Dubas is gone. You need to you need a complete reset of, of how you how you're willing to play the game, and maybe they'll learn and pivot later off in the year. But it doesn't seem like it. Sometimes, even though the numbers say so, the numbers aren't always right. Well, and I think at the end of the day, though, it, it doesn't. I mean, to a certain degree, it depends who it was. But you said it was Tavares who brought the puck back. Yeah. So I mean, he, he's supposed to be one of your top players, anyway. So. But he probably knows it's not a good play. He just does it because that's what the coach wants, right? Like. If that's, case, know that. mm -hmm. well, if that's the case, which is what we think it is, then then that's obviously a coaching error for sure. And, you know, time 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 management, knowing what time it is in the game. But uh, I don't care if it's Matthews, Tavares, or Ingvell or anybody else. I mean, I think everybody should be following the same systems, right? Mm -hmm. As soon as you allow – I mean, you're always going to allow your stars to get a little bit away with more. Yeah. And guys know that. But as soon as when it comes to a defensive part of the game, I still think, you know, that puck's got to be out. Um, and, and that's what's going to happen, right? So if the puck's out, it's farthest away from your net – um, towards the end of the game, um, I think it's it's the safe play. Always make the safer play, right? And having said that, you don't want to let off the gas and not play offense. I'm not saying that at all because no. that's when you get in trouble. That's when you fall back. But this isn't about that. That's about getting the puck out, making sure it's outside of your zone, mm -hmm. and you can still forecheck for it, right? So yeah. um, at the end of the day, that's one small play. But uh, I think uh, – um, I was going to say Dubas because we're always chirping him, but uh, Keith there has got to figure it out. And uh, they ended up getting away with the win. They had uh, – was it Riley that scored late? I yeah, with that. yeah, it was Riley scored late. Yeah, Riley scored. Riley scored late. And uh, anyways, looks like we got uh, our guest coming on. All right, guys, we want to welcome on our uh, guest for episode six today. Uh, this man is a, a goalie instructor out of Marmor, Ontario. He is the official goalie partner and consultant of Pay It Forward Sports and Boo Club Sports. Uh, you can see his work uh, with Stop the Puck Goaltending at stpgoaltending.com. Ladies and gentlemen, a uh, friend of the show, Lonnie Schwartz. How's it going, buddy? Lonnie. Great to see you, gentlemen. Great to see you. Thank you for having me. I like being on episode six. Is, I'm just trying to think of what Montreal Canadiens number is retired as number six. I don't. I don't think there's a retired number six. Slipping so, my mind right now. So for for the viewers, uh, don't hold this against Lonnie, but he is a Montreal Canadiens fan. So uh, don't hold that one against him. They had a little rough uh, rough loss last night. I guess let's start with that, Lonnie, because we were going to get Jeff and I were going to talk about this beforehand. But what do you think about the play when uh, when Jake Allen gets run last night? I thought that was a little bit Bush League. I think it was Larkin, right? I thought he could have avoided that contact, and uh, I didn't really see much of a story made out about it today. But uh, from a goaltender's perspective, how do you see that play? I, I got to be honest with you guys. I have not had a chance to fully review the hit. I went to bed last night after checking out some wrestling in Coburg, and then I wake up to, oh, yeah, Dylan Larkin ran Jake Allen last night. And so those are interesting plays just in general because – Obviously, you got forwards playing hard. They're going hard to the net, and sometimes a collision's going to happen. And I was reading this morning even some guys saying, hey, look, I think goalies need to start kind of toughening up and 
expecting some of those hits because there's going to be collisions that are going to happen. And it's not to say that we're a weak, a weak bunch. I mean, come on, we stand in front of that rubber without hesitation. So I'd have to review it to give a fair assessment. But I mean, obviously, as part of the brotherhood, you never want to see a goalie get run. Never mind the scenario or situation that's involved. And now he's hurt. And now you see the abundance of Montreal's goaltending depth. <laughs> and we're really, we're really going to be treated to the Montreal Canadiens just getting absolutely shredded still. It's, it's becoming very clear as the team how much they actually, not that it wasn't clear before, but how much they relied on Carey Price, but then double that down. And selfishly, I kept, I kept Jeff Petrie in my hockey pool thing. All right, Petrie's going to step up. He's going to fill the void. He's been playing great the last few years. Great points average. He's, he's going to step in for Big Daddy Shea, and he hasn't. And you can definitely also see on Montreal how much of an impact he's had on that team. I mean, do you think for one second anybody would get remotely close to a goaltender with Shea Weber near that net? Not a chance. What? Man Mountain Weber. I think that's just the depth. There's the thing. There's no one to be scared of on that defensive crew. Well, I guess Sherrod's still there, but I mean, that probably would have been Weber's minute right there if Weber's there. And then Petrie, he honestly just gives them, like he, he pushes them slightly, Lonnie. Like it's it's very minor though, but Larkin's coming in hard and, and I think he could pivot. He could turn and go away, but he just, he goes right into it. And Allen, Allen's playing the puck, right? He's got no way to defend himself in that moment. And uh, man, I wish the Leafs fucking forwards crashed in that that hard. But, uh, <laughs> not for another story, but he, he, uh, if it was me, Shea Weber would probably be cross-checking him for the rest of his life if Weber was on the ice for that play. Like, that's how I see it. Well, that. nobody goes to the net hard when Shea Weber's on the ice because they know there's going to be a price to pay. And I think, as an interesting side note, because obviously fighting has been virtually eliminated in the show, right? We don't have the enforcer role nearly as predominant as it was 10 years ago. But there was always that consensus that if Shea Weber's on the ice, you are going to pay a price – and then a premium, and then overtime rates because that guy was just a monster. Anywhere you found, like, I loved it when he got traded to Montreal because obviously there was a big hullabaloo about that. Yes, I said hullabaloo. And PK was, you know, the big deal. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't worry about PK. You just got Shea Weber. And then you heard the likes of both Henrik Zetterberg and Jonathan Taves go, thank God I'm not going to have to piss blood eight times a year anymore because they would tell the stories of going into the corners with Shea. And it's like, yeah, so I got a massage in my kidneys with all those lovely little rabbit cross checks into them. And after the game, my urine was a different color of red. So you know, it, it just spoke to the impact that he had as a defenseman when he was on the Western Conference. And then when he came to Montreal, I'm like, Montreal won this trade. And a lot of people said to me, are you out of your mind? I'm like, am I ever out of my mind? <laughs> no. And then we look almost a decade later, feels like that at least. And PK's played on how many teams since and has become the PK show. And look at me and how much I can chop onions at an LA training facility after buying a New Jersey Devils shirt, getting traded there. Yeah, no, the PK Subban experiment, unfortunately, has gone towards the look at me and look who I am and the product on the ice suffered. And you have the total opposite with Shea Weber with the only thing that I speak with is my play on the ice. That's it. So. His presence is missing. Carey Price's presence is clearly missing and will still be for a little while because while he's out of the drug treatment, he's still saying, I'm going to need some time to get back on the ice and, and feel at ease. So it's great that he's going to be available. But yeah, now Montreal's depth. And as you just pointed out, yeah, crash in the crease. It just, as, just as a whole, you're right. There's quite often that we look at those plays and it seems like, couldn't they just peeled off? Why didn't they? Yeah. And... <clears throat> so anyhow, anyhow, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation. It's a, it's a good question. Just, it's just unfortunate that those things happen, but yeah, I think there is a sentiment as well, just to wrap it up that, you know, sometimes goalies got to anticipate that too. And you see some guys, I mean, you even see uh, to draw to carry price. You've seen him play the puck behind the net, saw a guy coming. What did he do? Drop the shoulder down. That guy went down. So maybe a little more awareness from a goaltender. I mean, even at beer league, I've had that happen who hasn't had that happen in beer league. And there I am in my butterfly. I saw the guy coming and I just leaned my shoulder down and 
You know, I wasn't the guy falling over at the end of that. Not to say that I'm out there, the Scott Stevens of goaltending kids. It's not happening. You now, you're teaching, now you're teaching stop the fuck goaltending, Lonnie? How so, to get the blocker up? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Actually, there's a really neat technique for goalies out there that you won't get a penalty. You don't want to punch the guy. But if you take your blocker, right, and he's in front of you, and you just jam down on the kidneys right there, right above, right above where the pants are, you know, you get that blocker and dig it in and push downward. They're going to move out of the way. They're going to move <laughs> out. Of the way. It's a little technique. It's not a punch. It's not a cross check. Just a the ref's not going to do anything. It's just a little gentle push on those kidneys, and yeah. they tend to swerve out of the way ever so slightly. So I, again, with with the uh, the whole you know maybe not running of a goaltender, but bumping of a goaltender, all that stuff. How do you feel as a goalie and a goalie coach as far as where the game's gone with that? Because years ago, I mean, you know, you know, we all know how hockey was, you know, nineties and before. I mean, you put, you touch the goalie, you, you're getting jumped. There's no question about it. And I don't think that necessarily needs to be in the game. But I still feel like, hey, if, if a play like that, that happens to – I'm a Sens fan, obviously, as you can see. That happens to our goalie, and you're thinking, hey, he could have got out of the way. I want someone to do something about it. That's how I feel about it. I don't care if they take a penalty. I'm not saying they got to kill the guy. I just think, hey, th- this is our guy. you got to protect your house, and that's our house. And if all of a sudden your goalie gets – if it happens once and nobody does anything about it, my philosophy is, why won't they do it again? I can go near that goalie, right? And that's what you're talking about. Shea Weber's on the ice. If he's on the ice, you're not a chance these guys are doing it, right? Because they know. They know, hey, listen, right? So that's where I think sometimes maybe they got to take a penalty if, if, unless there was one called and then could be evened out. But do you know what I mean? So what's your thoughts on that? Well, like I alluded to earlier, I've kind of leaned away from fighting as part of the game because unfortunately – it, it's no longer a deterrent. A lot of people use that word, a deterrent. And if it's going to be a deterrent, that means that guy's got to be on the ice all the time. Like he's got to be on the first or second line. People forget Bob Probert was a first or second liner, right? Whenever Eiserman was out, Bob Probert was out. It wasn't two shifts later. It was, no, you touch Steve Eiserman now, and in a millisecond, you've got big number 24 coming and filling you with those knuckles. And if it wasn't him, it was Joey Koser. So as we've drifted away from that and the role changed dramatically, it no longer became about a deterrent. And then there are certain players who you wouldn't call an enforcer, right? Scott Stevens, by a rule, was not an enforcer. However, not only was he a first-line defenseman, you knew that if you got your head down, and you got caught in those trolley tracks, or you even came near the goaltender, that might have been your last day playing professional hockey. And we don't have guys who are cut from that cloth as much anymore. And yes, the game's changed. The way Scott Stevens used to hit is now for not going to happen again. But there are still guys who, if you, if you breed a hitter with today's rules, you know you know that that's going to deter a lot of guys from making those kinds of decisions, rushing hard to the net. Because when they get caught rushing down hard to the net, they know a guy like Stevens is there. You're not getting close to the net, right? You're going to get hit. You're going to get real hard. So I I think that's a bit of a lost art. And I've always maintained that, that it's perfectly legal. And if done right, that's going to scare the shit out of just about anybody. I don't know a single player that you ever talk to. I'll give you a funny anecdote about Stevens. I played hockey with a gentleman by the name of Brian Wilkes. Brian Wilkes was actually involved in the Gretzky trade. And Wilkes was drafted first overall, or not first overall, sorry, first round by the Kitchener Rangers. And Scott Stevens was already an NHL draft pick on the Kitchener Rangers, of course, though he's still playing his junior out. And in the very first practice, Stevens annihilates Wilkes, like annihilates him. Four hours later, Wilkes, he's like, what happened? And they're like, oh, yeah, Stevens hit you. And the coach even reamed him out. And, and, and Stevens just, there was one gear with Scott Stevens. It was kill. Mm-hmm. Play defense, kill. And we don't have that anymore. And, and I think personally, if you have defensemen bred like that, you're going to see a whole lot less of what you're calling out as, as run in the net and, and that kind of a deterrent. I, I, I still think the body check is one of the most, violently beautiful things in all of sport and if you do it right and you're not just leveling guys with a big charge or bringing the elbow to the head man that shoulder to the chest you're done you're done so i I think that's the role that we need to really develop more 
as opposed to somebody who's just a designated fighter. Because again, if they're on the fourth line playing five minutes, you know, what difference does it make? Sure, I'm going to run the goalie. What difference does that make? Because it's only going to be five minutes later that I'm going to pay the price for it. Mm-hmm. So getting back to the original thought, there's a big difference between revenge and deterrence. And there is no thesaurus in the world that will put the two together. So there's no more deterrence. There's no more real deterrence. So if we get back to that and we have those physical players, like a Ken Danico as well, right? You weren't going anywhere near Marty Broder. It wasn't just Scott Stevens. If, if, you, if you got through Scotty, well, then you had to pay with Big Kenny too. So yeah, we talk about Weber. We talk even classically. Larry Robinson was never considered a fighter. However, if you ask Dave the Hammer Schultz about the guy he, he was pretty much scared of the most in the show, it was Larry Robinson. Because he tells a story about going into the corner and he was ready to fill some guy. Robinson literally picks up Dave the Hammer Schultz, arguably the most legendary enforcer of all time, picks him up, turns him around, grabs him by the sweater and just starts filling him. And, and Schultz is like, good Lord. Good Lord. So... Maybe it's, maybe it's a guy like a Weber or an old school Robinson or, or Danico's and, and Stevens of the world that we need to protect our goaltenders more so than, say, your traditional enforcer. And, uh, I'd, I'd be reminiscent if we didn't add in Chris Pronger, one of my favorite defensemen of all time. He kind of played. Oh, too, the right? best. <laughs> I would say the Pronger's best chirper in the history of the game. Yeah. The mm-hmm. best chirper in the history of the game. Period. There's no one better. There will never be anybody. I've never heard a guy say, what, he's got two minutes? Two minutes for hurt feelings? A little torn heartilage? Like, that guy just was just, rhymed him off. Rhymed him off. I I would not want to get into chirp war. Oh, man. Yeah, Pronger, big and mean. Big and mean. Exactly. Exactly. One of my favorite players of all time, for sure, is Chris Pronger. But, uh, Let's kind of let's kind of pivot off well, this. Can we go? Hold on, Glenn, because he he talked about what he did last night, and I'm interested. So you talked about the goalie, but so where did you go last night? What was going on? Because I'm a wrestling fan. We're both wrestling fans, fans, buddy. I don't even want to hear about it. sports tournament. We have the belt and everything. So I went to Northumberland's wrestling over in Coburg. I was I was, I had a blast. I got to see my buddy Stone Rockwell. I, I know that guy from years ago. I actually used to work with him at a movie theater, and he was always a big wrestling fan. To, to see where he's arrived is, is great. He's a great guy, great character, great wrestler. I also got to see the return of Tyler Turva, the Saturday Night Delight. He is, he is an outstanding indie wrestler. It was actually a really, really good card. I, I'd be happy to go back and check out Northumberland and what they're offering. So what is this federation that's that's going on? Is it just Northumberland, or is it- it's just Northumberland as a pro, oh, as a really? as a promotion? They said they have a couple other promotions under the same belt or something. I don't know, but anyways, Northumberland they put on these shows, and and apparently there's going to be one coming in January, so there's going to be some news about that. But yeah, man, I I love the pro wrestling. I awesome. I grew up with. I was a huge mark, and to this day, to this day, Mister Perfect is my favorite wrestler of all time. Yeah, what a he like. Absolutely. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, you well, I actually have WWE. A... Was that? AEW or WWE right now? What do you You know, I got to say I don't watch as religiously as I used to, but based on everything that I see and everything I read, there's only one wrestling federation now, and it ain't the WWE. It's <laughs> AEW, man. There we Good go. God. Oh oh my god. That. It's awesome. The talent <laughs> Yeah. The talent and focus on wrestling. Are you kidding me? Yeah. It's like, just go out there and cut your own promo. Okay. Yep. I'm not going to be whispering in your ear. Go cut your promo and then go out there and work and wrestle. You're not a sports entertainer. You're a wrestler. I think Daniel Bryan has been pretty vocal about that saying, yeah, it's really nice to call myself a wrestler again. Well, give it three years. And I'm telling you, that's, I mean, the problem is, is WWE is so big and so worldwide that it's hard to really take them down. Uh, but well, I mean, never as far as AEW, down, they're getting there. Cut in. What's that? You're never going to take WWE down. You just got to cut into the market, right? Like you well, got exactly. You know, they could have said the same company. thing about WCW, though, guys. They could have said the same about Ted Turner's big bucks behind WCW, yeah. and look what ended up happening. And I think sometimes, even if if WWE is top of the mountain, you can reach that peak. And when you're not careful. And, they, and they're denouncing AEW. They don't even consider them competition. Mm-hmm. And then companies that do that, 
they tend to just get too complacent and clearly the WWE is because I mean, I won't watch that product. I, I think Roman either. Reigns is garbage. He's a terrible oh, wrestler. Man, I, he's horrible I like on the more, microphone. More I, hear you. Just, <laughs> I feel the same way. He's, he's terrible. Daniel. He's just terrible. There's like the one he's a terrible wrestler. It's Superman punch and it's just, it's boring as hell. There's nothing going on. And yeah, I, I couldn't agree with everything you're saying right now. And I actually have a couple buddies that are right into the wrestling. One guy um, is fighting. I don't know if he is back from COVID, but before COVID, he was fighting in the Ottawa Federation. Um, it, little guy, about my size, but about 100 pounds less. <laughs> but he's awesome. And then another buddy of mine actually has a ring here in Belleville uh, in a big barn. It's fucking sick. So, uh, yeah. It's I might have to get I might have to get in the ring there and take a few Let's bumps. I actually, hey, in, in, <laughs> in a past life, in a past life with Destiny Wrestling, actually, I had I had a character named Paul Showman. I was the ring announcer for a couple of events. And I'm going to tell you right now, if a gentleman by the name of Congo Kong ever chased you around a ring, it's not a work. It's it, like you run for your life. That's a, like a 400 pound man who's like six foot seven. He's just running after you. You run. You run. Even if it's a work, it doesn't feel like a work. So, yeah, tons of fun. Tons of fun. Guilty pleasure is definitely wrestling. I, like I said, I loved it since I was a kid. And, and you know, the problem being a lot, though, is, is that the WWE really, really strayed from what gave it reason and purpose and what made it entertaining. And and now just to see the stars that are going to AEW and actually being able to wrestle, not doing the same five moves, not just this is your set speech and very, very little exception to that rule. So, yeah, AEW coming around with a billionaire behind it, sitting there going, I'm a wrestling fan, and I'm going to let the wrestling fans, or sorry, I'm going to let the wrestling minds dictate what goes on. That's the way to go. And Vince McMahon, who clearly is well past his expiration date on what the public likes, he's he's going to suffer the consequences of it. It's going to happen. It may not go ever out of, it may never go out of business. It's going to be hard to say that the WWE will go out of business, but, I think we could really see a sustained period of AEW just riding it out and saying, yeah, we're, you want to wrestle? You want to wrestle at the, the highest levels? This is where it's at. So it was nice to see them come along as competition. And of course, of course, how could I not mention one of the keys to their success is the single greatest entrance of all time. Even if it was in WWE, I don't care. I was at somebody's house on a couch and when that walls of Jericho broke down against the rock and just, Oh yeah. When he entered, we all got out of the, We all got out off the sofa and we were marking out huge. <laughs> we weren't there and we're just like, Oh my God, yeah. I'll watch that like five times over every time on YouTube. I'm like, Oh yep. yep oh yep. No, yep. play it again. Play it again. No, yeah. My, my little, my little passion besides hockey. Uh, there's a few more than just wrestling, but yeah, that's, that's a fun promotion. It's fun to go and see indie wrestling because you end up seeing some real good, talented wrestlers. They put on usually a pretty good card, get a few bigger names that are on the indie circuit to draw in more fans, but it's a, it's a good show. And it was only in Coburg, so not terribly far from you guys and not terribly far from me either. I would yeah. definitely go 100%. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Ray, that sounds great. I, I love those little shows. We used to go to them in Belleville. Um, I remember one of them, it was an indie show, but uh, Jake the Snake was there. So they brought him in as the big name, and then they had all the – they do a lot of that, right? Another time was uh, uh, Bar Brutus Barber Beefcake. That was in Napanee, right? Napanee. Yeah. Did we go? Yeah, from you were with me there. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. took all the pizza from the locker room after. Remember yeah. when you showered? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh brother man. Brutus. Bonnie, yeah. Bonnie loves Domino's. We went so – the promoter said you can go back and see Brutus, and Brutus wanted no part of us, right? So there's like 10 pizzas in the locker room. He stayed in the shower for like half an hour. We're like, okay, he's obviously not coming out. Like, you just stay in the shower until we leave. So we grabbed like 10 Domino's pizzas. And off we went. We had a great night, buddy. Domino's Pizza, sponsor for Lonnie, right? Yeah, right? yeah that's Lonnie's main guy. So. Love that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Love that stuff. <laughs> Love that. It's sadly lacking in Marmara. But there's a pretty decent local that I, I like to hit up called Theo's. Oh, Cheap plug. Theo's. But, I know Jerry. He's awesome. Best pizza mm -hmm. going. I, if it wasn't Jerry's so a good away, dude. I would be there all the time. It'd probably be my favorite. <laughs> but they are phenomenal pizza. So good shout out to Jerry and Theo's Pizza. Damn right. Jerry and oh, Jerry and his Jerry dad, Denny. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry's joined the He's always good to me. Sure. <laughs> He's always good to me. So when it's local, I go to Theo's without a, without a doubt. Without a doubt. 
Yeah. So, anyways, where were we from? Where we got off track well, there? You were going to yeah, talk yeah. So, uh, oh, we went from wrestling to a little bit of pizza, which, by the way, for, for the uninitiated out there who question the value of pizza, if you do not watch a triple overtime game ever, pay more attention. Because what do they eat in between periods? Pizza. Believe it or not, pizza. The chef, the chef goes right into the kitchen, knows it's happening because there, yes, there's a fully functioning kitchen, obviously, at these rinks. And they go in, they make pizza in the dressing room, right in between periods. They mouth that down. They got energy for the next 20 minutes until somebody puts that baby to rest. And they're like, really? Pizza? I'm like, yeah, pizza. Pizza. And NHLers eat pizza in between overtime. Well, they're dying. People are like, no right? way. They're dying for carbs. Yeah. Right? So they got, they, you know, they got carbs. There. There's some protein. There's, there's a little bit of dairy in there. You know, you get a little, little hit of everything. And, and if you ask certain people, even vegetables, because tomato sauce comes from tomatoes. So there's a little vegetable in there, isn't there? There you go. There you go. So, all right, Flem, what do you want to talk about, buddy? So, so Lonnie, as we're on the Battle of Ontario Hockey podcast, it's obviously Brokey's the Senders fan, and I'm the Leafs fan. So, Let's talk about my guy. Let's get a little goalie advice on Jack Campbell right now. So under 2.0 goals against average right now. Give me your thoughts on Jack Campbell. And is he a guy that's capable of taking the Leafs deep into the playoffs? I, I always have reservations about goaltenders that were highly touted, right? Jack Campbell, U.S. talent, and came strong out of World Juniors. And then he had several opportunities to dethrone arguably the greatest American goaltender of all time, and that being Jonathan Quick. And he didn't. So you kind of look at that and go, is he really ready? He wasn't able to dethrone Quick. But he comes to Toronto, obviously had an outstanding start last year. It was a, set an NHL record for a debut with the team in consecutive wins, if I'm not mistaken. And so far this season, you can't look at him as the problem with the Leafs. Obviously, a lot of offense has been lacking consistently. What I what I was remiss about, though, is, is that, and, it, and it's very clear, Freddie Anderson is a great goaltender. I'm not going to sit here and say he's winning the Vesna this year or anything like that, but, you know, he's another victim of Toronto media running a player out of town. And while, yes, in the playoffs, he had a couple of inopportune games, it's also a team game where... 18 other guys were asleep and weren't able to put that puppy to bed. Like, was it, they had two games to do it and they still shit the bed and Boston, you know, comes out and wins. So you hang that on Freddie. That, that was hard for me to swallow. And then the Leafs didn't even tender him an offer. I understand. And he took 4.5 million to play in Carolina, which was interesting to me because that's half a million less than what he was earning with the Leafs. But getting back to Campbell, he's, Starting to prove that he's a number one guy, but I want to see a full season's worth of a goaltender. And that's, that's always been my bar, right? Even if it's a forward and somebody says they're generational, I'm like, yeah, they're generational until they get on the ice in the NHL and then they play against a bunch of men. So I, I kind of reserve judgment so far this season. Again, he hasn't been a problem. He's been playing great. But it's an 82-game sked, and we got to get on full on before I even judge and say, yeah, he's definitely a capable number one goaltender. I'd like to see the rest of the season play itself out because oftentimes you see goaltenders have those hot starts or look like they're going to be a bona fide number one, and then players know goaltenders just like goaltenders know players. They start to pick up those habits. They start to see, you know, you could have you could have sat there and said, "Oh, Garrett Sparks came out of the AHL, was AHL goalie of the year, came in the league, debut games a shutout, you know, great resume on Sparks, and then nothing." And they had hopes for him to take over that number one spot. You don't groom a goaltender. I think they groomed him for almost ten years. Mm -hmm. So, my reservation again, it's not just strictly for Jack Campbell. It's for a lot of goaltenders where they're just in. They look hot at the beginning, but then players start to figure out their habits. And so when you combine that with the fact that he was unable to steal the job from Jonathan Quick and that, yes, he's had some initial success in Toronto, I just reserve judgment. I just I don't want to get overly excited about a goaltender and then he proves to not be 
what he presented initially to anybody. So that's my my general take, I would say. So he, I mean, he, look, you're a Sens fan. Patrick Laleem, for crying out loud, <laughs> he breaks Ken Dryden's record as a rookie to debut, and then he becomes a well, serviceable like, goaltender. Like, New and in Game 7 was what killed me with Patty Laleem. Do you guys remember that one? Oh, yeah. When he scored like two exactly down the wing and there were just like yeah. flop shots between his arms. Now I remember. Oh, I wanted oh. to cry. I think I punched a hole in the wall that day. I probably shouldn't admit that <laughs> online, but I, I literally wanted to cry. Game but, seven. But you see, there you go. You can associate with a goalie that's got a hot start <laughs> and then comes, I don't want to say flattens out or anything, but he's, he, again, he became a serviceable goaltender. Yeah. He wasn't. A bona fide, oh, look at that. We're going to have a tough night. It's okay. Well, he's Patrick Aline. He's pretty good, but, you know, he's going to be in the record books forever. But and like- and he supplanted one of the greatest of all time. So, yeah. and, I, and I always throw this one out, and you boys might have a laugh with this. You know, is, is, is what is it? Brian Boucher? Is he, is he the greatest goalie of all time? I mean, five straight shutouts, but I don't think anybody's going to sit there and say that guy's the greatest of all time or even anywhere and remotely close to the conversation of a top 100. But he's sitting there pretty with, what, five straight shutouts. So I contextualize goaltending over a longer stretch of time because, you know, unless you're a Patrick Waugh or a Martin Brodeur or even an Ed Belfour where you're just that generational, people tend to figure out those goalies after a year or even within the year. So give it the season and then I'll be able to say, oh, yeah, I don't know. He's, He's definitely legit. He's been able to carry the load and... And, and I hope to see that. Don't get me wrong. I might be a Habs fan, but I'm a hockey fan first. So I, I want the Leafs to succeed. Yes, you don't need to edit that out. I do want the Leafs to succeed. I think they're a good okay, hockey team. Okay, I don't team. like you anymore. <laughs> well, I'm, look, I wish the Senators were a better hockey team where I'd be <laughs> saying the same thing here. Although, yeah, really although. <laughs> Give them the Superman punch. <laughs> well, here's the thing I want to talk about with the Leafs, though. The biggest issue they have, I think, with the goaltending, and I 100% agree with you, you have to wait it out to determine a contract. But the thing, the problem is, is that, that like and Fleming and I have talked about this. If he turns into being the number one goalie, you know, the, like the, the, maybe a generational, I don't know, but now his worth is more and the Leafs don't have the cap room. So do you take... Sorry, you broke up a second. There's there's the haunting of ExploreNet. You're going to have to repeat oh, that because sorry. ExploreNet just cut me out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So, so do the Leafs take a risk and try and sign him now because of their cap space or do they play it out play the rest of the season and come the summer, maybe he wants a lot more money because the way he's played and he's proved that he's worth more money, but the Leafs probably can't afford to spend that much. So do they try and take a gamble now and say, listen, will you take, what was your number Fleming? Four million, five million, something yeah, like I that? Said, I said you can get him signed for three or four million over four years. Do you, do you, do you, if you, do you risk it GM, do you because of your cap? Do you take him for that kind of money? Yeah, because you're not going to get a starting goaltender for four or five million dollars yeah. unless it's Freddie Anderson. Yeah. Right. And then, and like we just said, Freddie decided, Hey, I don't want to play here anymore. I'm going to take half a million dollars less, pay less taxes and go to Carolina. Right. Cause there's always, there's going to be, let's just call it the media tax in Toronto, because truly you have to put up with that shit all the time. You got an ass clown like Steve Simmons who makes up stories and let's just face it. That guy, that guy doesn't know. I have no idea how he has the privilege of writing about hockey because all he was was a dad who coached his double-A kid, and now he thinks he's king shit. You go to an arena, and you try to... I, years ago in Toronto, I was at an arena, double rink, in Toronto, and I see Steve Simmons. I never met the guy. I know he's a columnist. You know, he's a talking face on television. I go up to say hi to him, and he gave me less time a day than I think Mark Messier would to any kid who's looking for an autograph. I'm like, Steve, the fuck, dude? You're a columnist, all right? You're, and you're a shitty one at that. And you're big timing people, dude. Get over yourself. You know, there's a reason why a lot of NHLers don't talk to that guy. He makes up story. Look, if Phil Kessel walks five kilometers both ways to get a hot dog, guess what? Walking 10k for a hot dog, you've earned that. <laughs> Never mind the fact, by the way, that he he's now what the third all time Ironman, 915 consecutive games for Kessel. Two-time so, Stanley Cup champion, Phil and the, Kessel. Yep. Brought the Leafs, and, the Leafs have played for every one of those fucking games, too. He's still on the books and through this year. So, <laughs> Yeah, but but getting back, to the, getting back to the question, yeah, I mean, if Jack Campbell's agent is sitting there going, yeah, we'll take four, you don't have much of a choice, and it's not a Koskinen, right? It's not, it's not like an Edmonton where, 
after what, like six games? It's like, oh yeah, we'll give him six million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> what? What do you? What? Sorry. What? What are you doing, Shirelli? Are you out of your mind? Like so. So when it comes to that, you're right because there's only so many bona fide starters, right? Yeah. So if he plays it out and say within the next couple months, it's like, no, he's playing pretty consistently. He's pretty well. He's got a good resume. Uh, let's let's give it a shot. And then what's the worst thing that happens? You have to trade a guy. And it's a four million to five million dollar contract in today's game. That's that's really not a lot. So, to to your question specifically, if if, if he's coming up and saying, "Yeah, I want four or five million bucks," yeah, if it's anywhere north of six, you're like, hold that, hold on there, Kimosabi. Yeah. Whoa, 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 slow down but, a little but, bit. But if he's smart, he's not taking that contract right now. I mean, I don't know why he ever would. Why not play out the whole season? prove himself and then say, listen, now I've proved maybe I am worth six. Let's see what you're going to do. Cause the Leafs are fucked if they don't. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, if they don't, sign, really who true. do they got? Who do they have? Well, they they got, like, like, what Marazic. are they going to do? Marazic Peter, Peter Marazic in the, in the friends, hospital. But that's the way I look at it. They don't like, mm-hmm. they got to sign him. What yeah, do you no, think, they Clark? definitely need him. Well, they, they, they could need definitely need him. <laughs> Marazic's not the guy. I think Marazic's shown through his whole career that he's been injury prone his whole career. It doesn't help that he comes in and lasts about two periods before he misses two months, right? So, I yeah, mean, and that's he's unfortunate because he's a really good goalie. When okay. Peter Marazic is playing, that guy is a top end talent. He really could be, but he, unfortunately, he like was, you said, he always was coming to the Czech Republic, right? Like he was a big deal coming out of junior. I think he played for the 67s uh, in the OHL, but. Uh, Got to interview him for that too, by the way. Really? That's Many a year ago in a past life, I, I met him before he was getting into the show and and great sense of humor on the guy, by the way. And you're right. Great pedigree, great future. Detroit was grooming him to to take over the job from Jimmy Howard. And that's that's what they do in Detroit. Like they groom you until yeah. you're ready. Yeah. And it just didn't happen there. And then in Carolina, like you said, I think they basically had the Peter Morazic wing of their local hospital. It's like, Oh, Peter's here. All right. Yeah, your bed's ready. Yeah. So it like seems Tim to Allen be happening show. here. <laughs> was that? Oh, you got, I watched home improvement the other day. You guys remember home improvement from years ago. And, <laughs> and Tim Allen takes one of his sons there and they're like, Hey Tim, Hey Tim, Hey Tim. Cause he's always there. That's what, I don't know. Maybe, maybe think of that. Tim Allen. <laughs> oh man. I haven't heard of Tim, the tool man, Taylor reference in a long time. Oh, That's a good him. one. I, I love it. <laughs> just like, just getting back to it. I mean, when you're the Leafs and you're in that cap situation and it depends what kind of team you are. Like if you're Arizona, sure. Maybe I'll wait till the end of the year and gamble on Jack Campbell. But if you're the Leafs, you need to win the next two, three years. You don't have an option to swing and miss. So yeah, if, if he comes to you and says 4 million, pull the trigger, hope for the best, I think. Cause you got nothing else. Yeah. Left up. I'd agree with you right there. Cause like, like we said, Four or five million bucks in the in today's scheme of things is really not an untradeable contract. It's not something that you're going to sit there and go, "Oh, that really did hurt us." We we made a huge overpay. So, you know, if if we're talking that ballpark, yeah, that's a wise decision, and you'd probably sign that before the ink is dry. So, yeah, you want to see him be successful. Like I said, Jack Campbell's got got a good history behind him, and you like to see stories like this. You like to see a guy who was once doubted as a starter because he couldn't take the job from an aging Jonathan Quick, but then he comes to Toronto and he's he's playing some really good hockey. So so let let's hope Soupy stays in Toronto and he is that that consistent number one that they're they're looking to keep and have for a few more years. I think that's, uh, I that's a, a great answer. Oh, go ahead. Go go ahead, ahead I, was, I think that's a great answer for the for the least fan that watched, but I had a question, but go ahead, Broke. You ask yours first. Well it's yours regarding the Leafs if we're already on the Leafs. No, I was moving off the Leafs. <laughs> okay, so my my first thing was, Quick has actually turned it around a little bit this year. Have you have you not thought? I I watched him play a couple games, and I think he's kind of I know he's older and, and kind of over the hump, but I just I was impressed. Uh, he got a shutout the other night against uh, Ottawa, and uh, who? No, 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 Balvo. He got a shutout against Balvo the other night, buddy. He didn't <laughs> shut out Ottawa. <laughs> Jonathan Quick, Jonathan Quick, yeah, this I don't season. Know, I just feel like he's had a decent decent year this year. LA's off to an okay start, you know, comparing what they what they were you know predicted. They're in a rebuild, so for the most part kind of thing. You'd like to think that he's having a bit of a renaissance, but there's another goaltender whose style, right? The way Jonathan Quick plays is really, really hard on the body. Really hard. And we've seen numerous injuries throughout his career related to the way he plays. So while it's really nice to see, because again, it's very difficult to make the argument that he is not the best American born goaltender of all time that used to belong to a gentleman by the name of Mike Richter. 
but Quick's career and the Cups, it, it's hard to argue. But like like I said, the way he plays, it's really hard to sustain that. And, you know, because every save almost looks like he's doing the splits, right? And he plays real low to the ice. He employs the butterfly slide a lot. That's hard on the hips. That's hard on the knees. That's hard on the back. So it's nice to see that he's got a bit of a renaissance going this season. But when is he going to be back on the IR? What are the Vegas odds on that? Oh, it's, okay. it's, you're probably not going to get anything better than even, right? And I'm not much of a gambling guy. Does that make sense? You're not going to get better well, than even? I just I, I I find that kind of fascinating because Fleming and I aren't goalie guys, so I would have never known how hard he was on his body playing that way. Would you, Flem? Well, I think he could kind of tell. I think it's how you feel as you get older. Like you can tell that he does the splits pretty much every save, right? So I mean, not being a goalie, I don't know how that's gonna gonna relate. But I mean, those types of injuries, like those groin and those soft tissue injuries, like your hamstring, like once you get those, like it's kind of a thing that just lingers with you, and it's how you how you can deal with it, right? But I didn't know that it was gonna be. Harder on his hips necessarily. I just know how it feels to get older. And uh, well, the hip, the hip flexors, it exercises the hip flexors. You'll also, you'll also wear out the cartilage in there, right? You'll hear, you'll hear a lot about hip displacement, and there's, there's been a lot of thought about that in terms of physio, in terms of exercises, because since the position has gradually become more dominant with the butterfly, because. Let's let's remember, by the way, very quick history lesson. The butterfly was born in 1959. Glenn Hall is the granddaddy of that technique. And then it kind of got handed down to Tony Esposito. And then a few goalies in the 80s played that style. And obviously the most notable of all time is Patrick Waugh, right? So over the years, because of how predominant it is, and then even the evolution of the butterfly, Right, because we didn't have the same pads in the '80s that we do now. There's a gentleman by the name of Pete Smith who now works for Warrior, who essentially redesigned goalie pads. The knee landings that we have right now, where we can do those slides in the butterfly, because everybody laments, "Where's the two pad stack?" Well, the two pad stack, as great a save as it is, really puts you out of position for a secondary save. And now, because again, when we grew up, it was okay. Goalie makes the first save. That's it. Well, now the goalie is on the hook for not just the first save, but why didn't you make the second one? And maybe you could have made the third. I'm like, wait, what? But it's because of the technique and the way it's changed with our butterfly slide. So that's from a standing position, sliding across to take a one-timer. Or if you're already in your butterfly and you see that push, a power slide. So there's a little bit of the goalie grammar and lingo for you. And those techniques specifically, you can really look to when they started to get employed that you could see where those, those, those hip impingements are coming from and the hip flexor injuries and the knees. Like it's, it's really hard. When you're a goalie, people fail to really recognize what you're doing to your body is abnormal. You are not supposed to do what you're doing with your knees, your toes, your hips, just the butterfly itself to flare out your toes is a different kind of strain on your hips and your knees and your entire lower body. So you accumulate that over the years and clearly the way quick has done it has been very aggressive. It catches up to you. So, you know, I, I, again, I'd love to see guys have long standing careers and it seems as though, again, a lot of the physio and, and the exercises that are being developed to compensate for these things we're seeing somewhat lesser injuries, but you could see like a few years ago, it was like, he's injured, he's injured. Or guys like Jonathan Quick, it's like, he's injured again. It's a lot of that result is from the style of play and the way he wears his body. So yeah, I'd love to see him sustain an entire season, but that's, it's highly unlikely. And, and I don't, this, I don't want, I don't want to be right. I really don't want to be right there. And for all the viewers, this is why you go to stop the puck goaltending. Lonnie knows everything here. So if you are a, a kid or a parent of a kid, you know you want to get the best advice, go see Lonnie. Or if you're an older guy and you pay in the uh, play in the pay forward sports tournaments, visit Lonnie to achieve your saves. Uh, best around. So <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. You even even got the tagline right. So, I love it. I, I, it to, to achieve your saves is that it? I like yeah, it. yeah. We want achieve to help you achieve your saves because we don't have goals. One of my students years ago, I said, "So what's one of your goals?" He's like. Coach, we don't have goals. We have saves. And I go, you're brilliant. 
<laughs> so I, I, I always credit good marketing one. I always credit Jacob Jansen with that. Coach, we don't have goals. We have saves. That a boy, Jacob. Smart kid. That a boy, yeah, Jacob. Sure. <laughs> so, okay, moving on, going on to another goalie. Uh, I want to hear your scouting report, if you have one, on Philip Gustafson with the Belleville slash oh. Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to say that I, I've got one on him, but I'm going to be empty-handed on that because I, I don't. I need to come down to Belleville and check him out more, clearly, because – Hey, maybe uh, maybe us three go hang out. We watch some Sens action, and and I get a better preview of him. He's actually been playing quite a bit in Ottawa. And I, th I think he's their best goalie. But uh, you know what? Matt Murray's been injured a little bit, so yeah, yeah well, he's had Matt to step Murray's in. Matt Murray's another guy that's always hurt. Like he just he hasn't played a full season his whole career. I don't think. You know, and he's yeah, he's, he's Stanley Cup champion, but he still doesn't. I don't think he's ever played a full season. He's an interesting character in a lot of ways because one could argue that, yeah, he's a starting goalie, he's a two-time Stanley Cup champion, and he really, he made Marc-Andre Fleury expendable, right? Yeah. You don't leave Marc-Andre Fleury unprotected in an expansion draft when you don't think you have the ace in the hole. But as a lot of people pointed out, there were just certain things in his style of play. Of course, you mentioned injuries, but there's, there's always a reason behind a stereotype and one of the knocks on him has been, Hey, just shoot glove side. Right. But then there's always ways to work on that as a goalie. You're going to spend a lot of time redeveloping that in the off season. So, you know, if, if we can see a little more of Matt Murray, we might better get, get a better indicator of where he's made improvements in his game. And I can see as a Senators fan, it would frustrate you because I mean, I mean, geez, you know, it all starts from the crease and out. And when you get a bona fide starter, or at least what you assume and hope to be a bona fide starter, and then it's a guy who's just consistently injured. And then when he is back, play isn't as consistent as you'd want. And you could even look back at, at what was it? I guess maybe last season isn't exactly a fair comparison, but as you know, his first full season in Ottawa, you know, you, you were hoping for more and it was like, we're not getting more out of this guy. So it could be, a, I could see how it'd be a bit disappointing as a Sens fan and how you'd want to be looking to the future and seeing, Hey, is there a guy in the system who can step in and be consistent? And, and you know, again, defaulting to a, the conversation earlier, you remember the Hamburglar? Oh yeah. 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 Hammond. Yeah. Everybody thought he was the next big thing. And is he? <laughs> no, he was the big thing that year and that was it. And, and then, yeah, he had a handful of games and then people solved them and you know, and, and when I, when I say these things, by the way, I want to caution something here because I, not for one second am I diminishing the accomplishments of these professional goaltenders, right? A lot of these guys get reassigned to the American Hockey League. The American Hockey League is the second best hockey you're going to see on the continent. So, you know, we've, we've only got 64 full-time jobs in the show. So naturally, there's going to be goaltenders who who – play pretty much a full career even in the American Hockey League and there's no shame in that I want people to really hear that by the way because it sounds like I'm kind of shitting on it but I'm not well right? if you want to pay people... me you want to pay me two to five hundred thousand dollars to play hockey in the American Hockey League I'll sign up tomorrow <laughs> exactly I, mean, I don't think there are a lot of people who would say no <laughs> I mean realistically it's professional hockey whether it's you know the NHL or not it's still a hell of a you know a hell of a career I think well, that's just it. And, and, and if I may touch on that, one of the things that stopped the puck goaltending, cheap plug, is I always try to tell my students that the dream should be to play professional hockey, right? Because if you limit yourself to just saying, I want to make the NHL, then you feel like a real failure, right? You don't make the show, you feel like a failure. And I've known junior guys who aren't goaltenders. Like, for example, I use this one as as my story is Mike Durazio, former defenseman for the London Knights, St. Mike's majors, like highly touted prospect. And he didn't end up getting drafted. And he was expected to like first, second round. And then he went through and just didn't get drafted. I want to play. I want to say even played world juniors and, and then went to St. Mary's because the OHL has their bursary for players to go to college or university. And then he went to Europe and played pro in, I want to say it was Scotland. And he said it was one of the most incredible and rewarding experiences of my life. And if you ask any player who has ever played a degree of pro hockey in Europe, they'll all say the same thing. I really wish when I was younger that I knew more about this 
because the opportunities that are here, while they aren't, you know, I'm not getting paid $9 million a year. If you're playing high level in Europe, you're probably going to see 100,000 euros tax-free. They're going to take care of your car. They're going to take care of your housing. They're going to give you per diem for the uninitiated. Anywhere in pro hockey, you get a little bit of money every day for meals. Well, if you're in your hometown in Europe and you show up at the restaurant, they know who you are. So that meal is usually comp. So what do you do? You pocket that per diem. And a lot of the players would even use that to go traveling, right? Because in Europe, you could be in another country in a half an hour. And then in another country, in another half an hour. It's not like Ontario here where it's like, hey, where can I be in a half an hour? I don't know, the other end of the city, right? So, Armra, so Jerry Steele. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to go to Theo's, you know. Is that still in Ontario? Oh, yeah. But, but that's just it, right? So I, I really like to illustrate to people that there's a lot more opportunities out there. And that, while well, yes, we all look at the show. That is the pinnacle. That is where everybody wants to end up. That is where every single hockey player dreams of going and doing this. Like, there's not one hockey player in this world who has never dreamed of doing that. And we both, all three of us know, whenever we're doing that motion, what is it? The holiest of holy grails. So I, I just want to make it very clear that for people out there who are uninitiated in this game, the American Hockey League is, is an old league. Like, I want to say it's about 100 years old, respectfully, as well. And so you've got a very storied league with great talent. And then you've got other leagues, like the East Coast. A lot of people might crap on the coast. Coast is still pro hockey. Arguably the third best league in North America. If, so like if you play in the coast, like you're probably in the top 1% of, of humans that play hockey in the world, right? Like it's, it's not a shame, right? Like, you know, you may not be, may not get all the glory that you do playing the show, but uh, I mean, you're still an elite level athlete playing in the ECHL or AHL. Yeah. You're one of those guys that's going to show up to beer league. And if you play anything less than the A plus league, they're going to be like, yeah. So what level of pro hockey did you play? Yeah. Because they're just that good. There's, there's minor differences in terms of like, if you hear a guy who's played, so Michael Hutchinson, for example, I, I used to work somewhere where Hutch was one of the goalies training, and he would explain the differences between the East Coast, American, and national. And he said, really, it's about execution of systems. Really, right? Because the defense in the East Coast, it, it's, I mean, it's pro-level defense, but it's not the same. And then it's not the same from there to the American Hockey League. And then in the NHL, it's just that sliver. It is that little sliver of how fast they shoot the execution of the plays so that is the biggest difference is just the speed of execution and the way these systems are between the absolute best and then there's again american hockey league great hockey and then you've got east coast where yeah they ride the bus they play 72 games a year and get this they get paid 500 bucks a week so they're not getting paid a whole lot of money. Your average East Coast, like you were talking about the A, anywhere between 500, maybe 750, depending on your contract. If you're playing the coast, you're getting paid around $21,000, $22,000 a year. So there is a dramatic drop in terms of how much you get paid. But these guys train. If you ever go and watch a training session with pro players, it's a mixture of guys in the NHL, American Hockey League, and East Coast. They're all out there. They're all firing pucks just like I like, I've been on the ice as a training target for pro guys, not routinely, but I can tell you, you're out there, you're going, yeah, no, those guys are just whizzing shots. That's what they do. So, yeah, I don't, I don't want to go, didn't want to go on a huge tangent about that, but I, I, I think a lot of people ignore those elements of the professional game. So I will, I will take one thing out of what you said, and I really like the way you said it, but instead of having, and this is for kids and, and teaching kids as they, as they get older and, and, you know, I think it's one thing I, you know, as you tell them is your, your goal doesn't have to be, you sure you want to win a Stanley cup and we all want to do this. Right. Right. But um, uh, it doesn't have to be NHL only. I, I like the idea of, you know, I just want to play pro hockey. And if you can get to there and make the NHL, it's a bonus and you know, you're making millions of dollars, but I love the idea. And I, I got a, a buddy of mine, uh, um, Sean Alon, who's played a lot of pro over in Europe and he had a lot of success and they do make a lot of money. Like you Stanley said, they cup to make, and he, Pardon? He, he does have a ring, but yeah. he, he's got a crazy stat. So, uh, Lonnie, he, he's got a – I might as well – I probably said it on here before, but 
He got a Stanley Cup ring before he played an NHL game. Do you know how you could do that? I think you end up either on the training staff or coaching staff nope, or nope, some nope, kind of nope, member nope, of the executive. No, no, no. He he was a black ace. So he never, you know what? Oh, ace? there you go. So okay. He was a there black you ace, go. Which is an American Hockey League player. Um, and basically they have a, if anybody doesn't know, they have a, uh, they, was it seven guys? Yeah. Every team has to six, seven play. guys. It's like a taxi squad if, yeah, if, for exactly. a lack of better terms. It's most people won't know what a black ace is, but if you stay taxi squad, they'll have a bit of a, a more of a clue on that. So, yeah. Yes. So that's what it was. And then they ended up winning and it was just Chicago And the next year. I think he played a first NHL game, but he, he only played a couple games and he's made a, a probably 10 years in Europe in the KHL, a, a bunch of leagues. And like you say, I love that idea of it doesn't have to be the NHL because I guarantee, I don't know what his contracts are, but they're in the hundreds of thousands of dollars or oh, euros. Yes. And he's getting a lot of stuff paid for, and he's had, he's had a lot of success. And and for to look at that, you have to look at that as that's a huge success as far as a hockey player growing up as a kid, dreaming of that. It doesn't always have to be the end result in the NHL. So I love the yeah, I love expand your thought, the dream on that. Yeah. Expand the dream. I, 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 if there's anything you should hear out of that conversation, expand the dream. I could even go deeper on the numbers for you because, again, there's 64 jobs in the show right now. 32 of them are taken. Do the math. So expand as goalies specifically. It's, it's. I think the number for players are in total in the in the NHL is about 750 full time jobs in any given year. So with hundreds of thousands of people around the world playing quite a few of them at the elite level, 750 <laughs> jobs, carry the one, add the exponent, divide by pi. I don't know what the equation is, but you know, it's, it's, it's infinitesimal. So you need to really expand that dream, expand well, I, it. There's no shame. I got a whole nother topic. I know you've commented on this on Facebook and last time has something else beforehand. Um, I, I have a feeling on it and we've touched on it a little bit. The change of dress code in the NHL, what's your thoughts? Austin Matthews. <laughs> Buddy, I know you're hanging out with the Beeb, and he looks like some guy who's got a squeegee at the corner of Bathurst and Queen and has tattoos that you don't know how they afford without a job and that you grew up in Arizona where whatever their opinion and value of hockey was at the most elite levels were. Buddy. No, that, and that's a hard no to anyone who says, well, there's no style or personality on the way. Are you fucking kidding me? Like these guys go to the tailor and it's like, so what color, what's the cut, how many pockets, pocket square, what kind of hat do you want to like, come on, watch those guys walk into a, walk into a rink. You mean to tell me they don't have swagger and style in the suits that they're wearing? I mean, that assume, is what helps. Think of that guy. Think of what he's worn. And, and I know we talked about him earlier, not talking about hockey, but just. No, no, no. But from just a branding standpoint. Right, but he looks fucking good. Yeah, he looks style. fucking. Mitch Marner. Mitch Marner is one of the sharpest dressed guys there is. And, and that's why to me, it's like, what? You want to walk in in designer fucking shorts? Come on. What are, you, what are you doing? This is part of the tradition of the game. And people say, well, traditions change. Mm, not for the sake of just saying, yeah, I don't want to wear a suit to hockey grow up come on and then the perception what was it some schmuck who they pay money to to write opinions on is like well it might help grow the game if wearing a suit to a hockey game is what stopped you from playing hockey i got news for you i don't want you to play my fucking game all right i don't I you can it. stay home and wear your shorts and go around to the basketball court i don't care you can play basketball great sport you want to go go to the soccer pitch and kick around a ball Fine. How about it, Haas? Where are your tracky? I don't give a shit. I don't care. This is hockey. This is hockey. You wear a suit. You wear a tie. You show up. You drink your drink. You have a little chew stuck in your lip there if, if, you, if you're down with that. But you come walking into the rink. You know, you see the guys are a little spitting a little bit. Yeah. Okay. But you wear a suit. Okay. There's not one kid in America in, in rural Arkansas, going, well, you know, now, and I don't have to wear a darn suit to play hockey now. I might just start playing some hockey instead of football. No, you're not. You're going to play football. Who gives a shit? This is the dumbest thing to come out of hockey. Like, really, Austin, shut up. You're getting paid $10 million. Go to Frank's in, in, in Kensington Market or whatever it is. Get your tailored suit and shut the fuck up and score some goals. 
I want a relaxed want... dress code. I want a relaxed dress code. Me and Bieber are hanging out a lot, so, you know. Shut up. Shut up and just look at what Chris Pronger did to your boy Biebs, okay? Shoved his face in the ice and said, <laughs> look at this guy. You know that picture? If you can't find it, by the way, kids, if you need to go out there and look up one of the funniest things ever and you want to see Justin Bieber absolutely plastered with Chris Pronger with the biggest shit-eating grin, like he's got, he's just shouldering that. Bieber into the glass. That. Bieber's face is like, ah, and Pronger's just like, <laughs> dress code. What, just yeah. what shows it's what you in the corner with Chris Pronger, I, boys. I couldn't agree with you anymore, man. And it, and it's all about, you know, you, you, you deal with young kids and I've coached kids and plumbing's coach kids too, but it's all about, you know, teaching them about the game, the respect. You show up, you look good, you're ready for the game, you look focused, you look like you're a team. You're a team. You know? And and that's what it's about, not just wearing shorts and this shit. And that, oh, I got this Drew shirt on or whatever they wear. It's garbage. It looks awful. And I love the, the Don Stray one. It looks like you're going to a barbecue. It's awful, and it doesn't belong in the game. And that's one of the biggest things Don Stray stood for, and I'm not bringing him up. I'm just saying we need more people that will respect. And it's not about changing the game because, like you said, if – if that's what's wrong with the game and that's how we're going to get more people, we don't want those people. Yeah, no, oh. it's, it, again, if you can't appreciate a suit and tie, you know what, just then you just stay watching basketball and, and watch load management and guys, oh, no, I hand it kind of sore. Uh, whatever, we don't need you. We don't want you. We don't need you. You can, can stay home. It's okay, right? I, I know we sit here and we talk hockey and we're very passionate about it. Canadians as a whole, we're very passionate about it, but one of the things that I've often said, and people think it's blasphemous, is like, look, we've had a long time to grow this game. And I know it was around the first work stoppage, the NHL was a hair, just a hair behind basketball in terms of overtaking them in ratings and, and, and what have you and value. And then that work stoppage happened. And it killed that momentum a lot. And they're saying, well, you know, are we going to get it back? It's like, guys, it's been like 20 years. Okay, that's a long time to try and catch up. And if people haven't caught up, we have to really appreciate that while in Canada, we're nuts for this game. In America, it's a very regional sport, right? Their, their pastimes are baseball and football. That's it. If you find guys that end up playing hockey and love hockey, great. But if you're looking outside of New York State, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Minnesota, you know, your, your real hotbeds, I might have missed a couple there, but you see where I'm going. Again, I said Arkansas earlier. You're not going to get a hockey hotbed in Arkansas. It's just not going to happen. I'm sorry, right? They're just not. Alabama, forget it, right? Like out of the 50-some-odd states, what, odd, out of the 50 states, what, you think kids from Hawaii are going to start picking up true sticks? Oh, we just figured out hockey here. No, you haven't. You're just not going to play. There's an arena in Honolulu, right? They're not playing to, to play in the show. And if we're pinning our hopes and dreams – on these markets to elevate the game's popularity. It's just, it's never, never, okay? You know you're supposed to never say never? No, never going to happen. We as Canadians eventually have to sit there and suck it up and go, look, we're never, ever going to be at the level of the NBA, NFL, or Major League Baseball. None of them. Like, I keep telling people, the NFL's contract for television is worth the entire revenue of the NHL and more just the TV contract for the NFL. So you, you add up the NHL's merchandise and ticket sales and everything else. You add all that up and the NFL goes, wow. All right. Well, that's pretty much what we give to green Bay out of the money that we get from all the television revenue. So I'm a realist about this game. And I have been for a long, long time. Do we want to grow the game? Sure you do. But is it going to grow that much more, realistically speaking? Pro probably not. I mean, I'm happy Seattle's got a team. People will go, Seattle, the first American team to win the Stanley Cup, you idiot. Get some history behind you, right? If there was a franchise and people were like, well, why wasn't it in Quebec? Because there were an odd number of teams in the Western Conference. I mean, come on now. It wasn't very hard to spell that one out. And as another footnote, because I can go on these tangents, as you can tell by now, until Jeremy Jacobs is no longer the director of the Board of Governors, like the head of the Board of Governors, Jeremy Jacobs, the owner of the Boston Bruins. And, and here's, here's another one of those for you. If you ask anyone who the most powerful man in hockey is, most people will say Gary Bettman. But you talk to people on the broadcast side or people who have some more intimate familiarity with the executive side, it's not Gary Bettman. It's Jeremy Jacobs. 
Jeremy Jacobs tells six other guys, this is what we're doing, period. That's it. When the Board of Governors gets together, Jeremy Jacobs says no. Okay, well, then it's no. Right? There's, there's a reason there's not a team in Quebec. That's Jeremy Jacobs. Right? He's been on record saying they don't have enough population. No, not going to happen. Don't hold your breath. Even what? though there was that wink, wink, nudge, nudge, build the building and we'll get you a team. Well, how many years ago has, been, has that been? Yeah. So, you know, that, that's the unfortunate nature of our game is we have to accept its positioning where it is in the major sports, right? We don't even sniff NASCAR, right? Throw in NASCAR, right? Out of all the major sporting interests, hockey's like sixth at best, at best. So as much as we love it, as much as we want to see it grow, and it, and it will still grow, but it's never going to be at the exponential rate or the mass rate that we all expect or think it is, because it is the greatest game in the world, right? Objectively speaking, I look at it, it's the greatest game in the world. The fastest game, it's got the hitting, it's got the scoring. I mean, if you can't find a way to be excited about guys like Connor McDavid or, or Patrick Kane, for that matter, and a lot of the wealth of talent that's coming up, then you're never going to be interested, ever. If you can't watch what's going on right now and appreciate the talent that's there, or that has been there, right? If you couldn't watch before Pavel Datsyuk was retired and say, holy Jesus jumped up Christ, how did that guy do what he did and not find a way to be attached to the game? You're never gonna, right? So I'm a bit of a realist when it comes to our game. As passionate as I am about it and as much as I'd love to see it grow beyond what it is and what it should be, you can't force people to be interested in, in a sport, especially when in America, where you want to consume the most, it's, what do you want to grow up doing? Win the World Series. Oh, well, what about you? Vince Lombardi Trophy. What about the Stanley Cup? Sorry, who's Stanley? And what's his cup? Will they, will they especially the Southern the states and all that. Yeah, especially, especially there. And, and I mean, we've had how many experiments in Florida at this point, right? There's a reason players still go to Florida. There's a reason why Steve Stamco said, Toronto, are you kidding me? I remember that when it was like, oh, we might get Stamkos. I'm like, you, you, do you realize he flies his family down for six months a year? His dad gets to golf every single day. He pays low. He, pay, he pays very low state taxes. I was like, Steve Stamkos is not coming to Toronto. Don't hold your breath. It's just not going to happen. Right. But has he grown the game there? Has Kucherov grown the game? Not exponentially. Florida certainly hasn't. So, and Florida is one of those teams that we often banty about saying, well, is there a team that we can move? Florida. Yeah. No, it, it's that's just the game. That's just where it is. That's what it is. No, for sure. And I think that's a, that's a great perspective on it too, right? Is it, you know, at what point do you want to grow in, and do you really want that crowd in? But uh, I just wanted to maybe say this quick: How long for they pull sure. the plug? How long do they pull the plug on Phoenix? Like, I think that's been a, you know, that's been going on for you know, 10, 15 years now. Like they were going to come to Hamilton with Bal uh, with Jim Balsilli, I think is his name in like two thousand six. Didn't happen. Is that? Uh, I mean, when is Batman? There, there's got to be pictures. Yeah, yeah like, like there's no other explanation have, other than there's got to be pictures. They have three points this whole fucking year, and they're still yeah. You know, uh, it doesn't make sense. Like I, either there's pictures of Jeremy Jacobs and 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 Gary in a compromising position or something that someone in Arizona has. I don't know what they've got. It's got to be something that bad for them to be holding this egg over everyone because it's like now we want to build another rink. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. You, why why it's been like you said it's been 20 years of almost no growth and then you and, and yes you could point to austin matthews as being a product of arizona hockey but the exception doesn't prove the rule like one player out of 20 one yeah. one come on and the ratings are there that are so I, I say when they are there they're there to prove that there's nobody watching them there's no butts and seats the greatest joke of one of the greatest jokes of all time is, oh, hey, look at everybody who's dressed up like a seat. It's another night of Halloween there in Arizona, right? It's the most popular costume at the arena. <laughs> so, so despite potential successes, and also, let's face it, like the teams they've put together, really, when you have to sign guys to meet the league minimum salary, you know you're not putting any real tangible effort into putting a winning product out on the ice either. So it's, it's frustrating. What's that? Can I, can I interrupt you for a minute? Because I say this a lot. Yeah, of yeah, no. I really have a bone to pick with Phoenix and, and the management and just how that whole thing's worked. Because up until a few years ago, they still had Chris Pronger on their cap just to get yeah. to the mid. They still had yeah. Pavel Datsuk on their cap just to get to the mid. It's it's all fine and it's all fine and good to say you know we'll let you stick around and hang in the league if you're trying. There is no way in hell anyone can say Phoenix is trying to be competitive. 
it's just past that point now where they're scraping and clawing to get to the get to the floor, the cap floor, and they're putting out the worst fucking team the NHL maybe has ever seen. They have three points this year in 15 games. It's an embarrassment to the league. And if you want to grow the game, that's not a way to do it. Like it looks like beer league hockey. Sometimes you're watching it. It's just I, something I find unacceptable. And to the point of the NHL as a business perspective, I don't understand why you wouldn't pull the plug and move to somewhere that wants it. Even if you get less people, like why not move it to fucking Halifax? Like move it anywhere where there's going to be some passion. I think that and someone that I think the team, I think the city that's getting the most attention right now is Houston because they're a West Coast team. So the Western Conference needs to keep that balance. The unfortunate nature, because people have asked and said, well, why not Halifax? Guys, Halifax is the 300,000 people. Yeah. There's, just, there's no hope. There's awesome. literally a sub-zero hope of a team playing anywhere where there's a market of 300,000 people. Mm-hmm. You know, It's bad enough in Winnipeg. Winnipeg is arguably the smallest market. Well, it's, it's not arguable. It is because technically Anaheim is but Anaheim is literally right next to Los Angeles. So you're drawing from that crowd as well. Mm-hmm. But with, with a population of in and around 750 to 800,000 with an arena, by the way, that was criminally small, right? The arena in Winnipeg's capacity is just a hair over 15,000. Mm-hmm. And I think league minimum attendance that they hope for and expect is 14. So I was skeptical of Winnipeg. I was wrong. They've lasted fantastic, but where where do you where do you put a team like Arizona now? And and I've got to say it's probably Houston. They've got the population. They do in Texas have a certain affinity for the game of hockey. So you know, there is Dallas and obviously the the old North Stars. But now, yeah, you you want to have a team in Houston population that can sustain it. Obviously, some disposable income and maybe I don't know. No, that's Dallas. I would just gonna just make a J.R. Ewing joke, but that might have flown over everybody's head. <laughs> But, but but aside from that, yeah, where do you find a team? Because we were just talking about it earlier. Is there somewhere else in the southern states or in the west coast that, that is fitting for a team? California's already stacked. You're not going to throw another one in Colorado. Seattle just got a team, right? Are you going to put them in Montana? Like, there's only so many places on the west that we can go. And people even say, well, why not Saskatchewan? Same problem. You've got a guy like Jeremy Jacobs saying, guys, they're – I think the entire province's population is a million people. Like, let's get real here. So there's got to be a population base in Canada to sustain it, and there aren't enough. Toronto will always block another opportunity within city limits. They just will, right? Because there's that, There's that, I think it's a 50-kilometer rule that, they, that they've got, which is why Hamilton is sketchy, and that Buffalo has sat there and said, yeah, if you give Hamilton a franchise, they're going to draw from us too. So... Hamilton got really the short end of the stick on that because I really think they've they've earned the ability to have a club and for whatever political reasons and nonsense that's there, specifically the Leafs and Sabres, it, it doesn't that doesn't help the game. And yeah. putting a team like Arizona in another market that clearly has no hunger for hockey, what's that gonna do? Mm-hmm. Right? What's that gonna do? So you're you're in a real situation there where you've got a shit team with a shit product that had no earthly business to be there anyway. And now you've got 20-something years of, all right, the arena lease, the NHL owns the team, we need another private owner who doesn't mind taking a tax hit, and now Arizona saying, oh, yeah, and uh, we want to build a new arena. And the funniest part is, well, it's so far from Phoenix. In the like, It's 20 minutes. Do a Google map search, right? It's a 20-minute drive. If you're not prepared to drive 20 minutes to go watch some fucking hockey, guess what? You're never going to go and watch hockey. Did they not 20 say minutes. that their lease is up at the end of the year and they're not going to re- renew it? Was that Did that not happen? I think there's some degree of lease being up and that's why there's a push to make a new rink, which yeah. is like, really? What What for? Well, they don't think they're yeah. going to yeah. a deal on the, on the current rink with the, with the lease terms. So they're, they're saying if, if this isn't going to work. I think it's more like a, a Eugene Melnick thing. Like, you know, like we want to go downtown, but, you know. Yeah, that's it's another thing, right? Like. That's another group of whining that I just have zero time for. Coming from Toronto, it's like, oh, no, we got to drive 40 minutes to Canada. It says, uh, uh, shut up. Just get in your car and drive. Well, we want to spend some billions of dollars. Then build some, like, build some light rail or a subway system that's going to get you out to Canada instead of, I don't know, building a rink. Have you heard about the rail systems in Ottawa right now? The whole in like downtown? Oh, it's- yeah, I haven't heard. It's wonderful. But you'd think that if you're going to put in that kind of money, that yeah. maybe, I don't know, benefit everyone. 
Yeah. I've, I've been like, if you're going to put that kind of money into an arena, how about this? Build a better transit system so people can get to Canada okay. Yeah, that's like, what, what you don't want to eat at Swiss Chalet across the street? Too bad, so sad. Come on. <laughs> Come on. I, we I have still, to drive 40 minutes. Oh, please. I still like Give to see. I, I, I think the balance thing that you talked about is tough. It's difficult where it's like balanced to the east and the west when, I mean, I think it's pretty well known with the populations a, a, in America and Canada um, that there's probably more hockey fans in the east. Would, would there not be? I mean. Yeah. So Just from the very that, nature of our climate. Now, yeah, exactly. From the, from the nature of our climate, where the populations are, everything. So, I mean, I, 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 I just think I find it tough that we just go, okay, we already have enough in the East, even though we got a team like Quebec or a place like Quebec dying for it. But let's look into Houston. Well, we've already looked in the Southern States and they haven't worked out. For me, it's like, stop looking at the frigging map and let's, maybe we could throw a team. I don't know. Uh, Cause you know, throw a team well, when they, West again or, but when they realigned all those divisions, because right when we grew up, it was pretty straightforward. It was the, the Norris, the Smythe, you know, and we had them all. We had the Adams, and we had them all lined up and everything. I know I'm missing one of them, but don't hold that against me right now. It's been what almost two decades since we've had those names. But point point being is that when Detroit was playing in the West Coast. They were doing back to backers, or they're doing the big old trip out to Vancouver, and then the next game is back out on the East Coast. So, you know, to realign the leagues was a big effort. And you especially had a team like Detroit sitting there going, How on earth are we on the West Coast? How is that even possible? Yeah. So, there were a lot of logistical issues that teams had some very legitimate concerns with. It's like, Yeah, we've got jet lag and we're about to play the first, first place team out here. Like, how is that? How is that reasonable? How's that fair? So, and I know there's adaptations and players have habits. They sleep on the plane and what have you, but there, there was very fair pushback for the geography to be what it is now so that there are, there's, there's less stress over the travel and the effect that it's had on players. It was a big to do with the league and the NHLPA. So unfortunately the way we are and how big the game is in terms of where teams are playing geography does matter. And so we do have to look at it from a West and East standpoint now because travel is, is obviously something that teams and players felt affected their game. I got one here, bro. Can I sneak one in? So Lonnie, <laughs> if, you're coaching, if you're coaching game seven of the Stanley Cup playoffs and you get to pick any goalie in the world, who are you taking? Current, Current. or historically? Current. But after this, because there's been a lot of Patrick Wall love. Give me your best goalie of all time after, because I got a feeling you're going to say old Patty Waugh. Oh, the best goalie of all time after Patrick Waugh? Yeah. Okay. Martin Brodeur. Okay. okay. Martin Brodeur. He's the dominator. But let's not talk about him. You're not going to like my answer. But oh, I don't when, it, when it comes to the chips being down and I have to pick a goaltender in today's game, in today's game. Yes, today's game. Yeah. Now, are we, are we talking about giving him a, a, a significant enough lineup in front of him that will actually score more than two goals a game? In this fictional scenario, because just any goalie, just any goalie, Best any goalie, goalie well, then it's with any team, then, it, then it's Carey Price. Carey I'm Price. sorry to say, but if you give Carey Price an actual team in front of him that can produce more than two goals in a game, I'm picking Carey Price every day. Right? Look at what he did last season. Look at look at seasons where he's really progressed, and and in his past, he's been a money goalie. <laughs> Right, you don't win the Calder Cup, you don't win the World Juniors the way you do. It, 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 Carey Price is a money goaltender. Unfortunately, there isn't a money team in front of him. But if you put Carey Price on, say, the Tampa Bay Lightning, you'd almost be shocked that Tampa would lose a game. But then again, they've also got Vasilevsky in net too. So that's a, that's. Is Vasilevsky the number two goalie in the world, in your opinion? Uh, he's the number one goalie in the world. He's the one Andre one. Vasilevsky is okay. the number one goalie in the world. The only reason I choose Carey Price is because there's still that there's still that elite level and that compete. And I might have a little bit of bias, but I mean, we're talking about money on the line and game seven. Uh, I'm choosing Carey Price right now because he, de he demonstrated last year that he's, I mean, the guy's in his early 30s now. So people keep saying, oh, you know, he's past his prime in this. He's still, he's still got years left. He's still got some years left in the tank. And so long as he stays mentally fit and doesn't revert back to substance abuse, which I'm not throwing out there as a rumor now. He has come out now saying there were substance abuse issues. So if you've got a, a healthy carry price, I'm picking carry price. 
because he's still proven to be a, a consistent and elite level goaltender. Just unfortunately, he hasn't had a team that can put things away in front of him for his entire career. How many years do you think Kerry has left? I think he's got four or five good years left in him, or could he, could he possibly go more? Like he's a guy that's in shape, right? Goalies can kind of go on a little bit in years. How many, what do you think he's got left? Five, Brokey? He's got five left. I, I hope I'm not that five good ones. I'm saying he's got five years left. I, I yeah, I hope there's a good four or five years left in his career. I really hope that certain knee and concussion problems don't catch up with him because those have been some injuries that have caused pauses in his career in the past. So I'd love to say another good four, maybe five years for Carey Price as well. But you never know with injuries and the way that his game has been affected clearly by mental health and substance abuse. So let's just see how those years play out. But in a perfect world with unicorns and ifs and buts, I'm taking Carey Price and hoping that for the next few, four or five years that, yeah, we have elite level Carey. He's, he's, he's a gem, man. And I know he's had some rough years. And a lot of that still has to do with just the fact that he does not have a very good hockey team in front of him. Yep. People would always ask. They're like, well, Lonnie, what about Carey Price? I'm like, hey, how many career goals does Carey Price have? And they're like, well, none. So how is Montreal going to get more two, more than two goals a game? Because that's really, throughout his career, the average output for the Montreal Canadiens has been anywhere between two to three goals a game. You don't win a lot of hockey games like that. Just ask Harry Neal, right? Captain obvious of Captain obvious. You don't win a lot of hockey games when you're only posting two, three goals a game, kids. So the adage does not change. So, yeah, I, I, a lot of that is, I don't want to say even a lot. There's part of that is my gut. But, yeah, the number one goalie in the world right now is, is definitely Vass. But I, I'd still choose Carey Price right now. That guy's money. Love it. Glad you're sticking with him here, too. Just maybe we can just touch on this quickly. What's in, sure. in, the, in the Halak versus Carey Price days, what side of the fence did you fall on? Like the year where Halak got dealt, would Ooh, you have been a guy you that – because Halak was hot as hell. Like, there's no gentlemen, debate. gentlemen. Wow, did you ever step into the snake pit of questions? Then was it not 2010? So, back when that happened, I was running a website called Hockey54.com, and I was doing interviews with players, and I actually had media accreditation to be on the press conference call when Carey Price signed his two-year deal to Bridge, and they had decided to trade Halak, and. I was all about it because Gary Price is, is as blue chip as it was ever going to get. Yeah. Right. I was disappointed in the return. Oh, we got Lars Eller. Mm -hmm. Who? For the hottest goalie in the league right now, we got Lars Eller. Mm -hmm. Who? So I was always, oh, no, you keep Gary Price. You're ludicrous if you trade Gary Price. And even on that press conference call, I got in a lot of trouble because at that time, Maxim Lapierre and Mike Camilleri said, we got to play better in front of Carey Price. By the way, fast forward to over a decade later, what was Shea Weber sitting next to him at a Stanley Cup press conference saying, we got to play better in front of Carey Price? Sound like a broken record? So I was bringing those kinds of things up, but I said, no, you keep Carey Price, period. Plain and simple. You trade Yaroslav Halak, you get what you can for him being the hottest goalie in the league right now. You do not quit on Carey Price. And people were like, what are you talking about? Halak's the hot. <laughs> Carey Price is All the true. best goalie on the planet. At that time, there was not a better technical goaltender in the world. Period. No ifs, no ands, no buts. And what was it? He, he was injured. So in walks Halak and you play the hot hand. Right? So I was never, ever one of those people that said, yeah, you trade Carey Price. At least then. I would, I would say, though, last year you entertained the idea because Montreal lacking the offense that it did and Carey Price taking up about $10 million on your on your salary cap. I thought, well, if there is a time to trade Carey Price, it's now because he's still elite and you could still get a, a bona fide center and some offense that you've desperately needed for all these years. Like I always point out, the last player in Montreal history to score over 100 points was in 1986. Mats Naslund, and then and the last player in Montreal to score fifty or more, Stefan Riche. Like, this is this is not a team that's had the luxury of they, goal scoring. They needed a number one center for and an elite number one center for the past fifteen years, and that's something yep. every team needs to get over the hump. I think I don't think any team's going to win a Stanley Cup without a true horse down the middle. That can oh, but Brendan, Brendan, does he speak French? 
Yeah, I know, eh? <laughs> Like it was, I always bring this one up and a friend of mine who might watch this, he's going to say, Lonnie, could you please just shut up about it already? But Montreal could have had a very, very prominent center who may not have been born in Montreal or Quebec, but he certainly does speak French very fluently. I do want to say he is the pride of Hearst, Ontario, and that's Claude Giroux. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a career flyer right there and a guy who definitely had a, a sustainable career as an elite center in the league. He might not be what he was maybe three, four years ago, but I'll still take Claude Giroux. There's no, there's no doubt in my mind. Claude Giroux was a top 10 center in the NHL for a good four or five years. Like I don't know, going back a few years, like, man, the guy was unreal played for the Quebec ramparts. I think like that's a, that's a swing and a miss on, on taking Giroux for sure. Yeah. I'm huge miss. And Montreal's drafting outside of Carey Price overall really has been, Big snafu. They they yeah. just have had terrible scouting, and people who keep defaulting to, well, you know, they traded away certain picks X, Y, or Z, this, that, or the other. I'm like, then 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 how did Detroit manage to sustain the talent pool that they had for two and a half decades? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You need good scouting. You need you need smart general management, and that was another disappointment too, because you know Bob Gainey was the guy who did draft Carey Price, but then for years after, it's like. You know, you know that meme where there's that stick figure poking something, do something already. Yeah, that was it with like Bob Gainey and everything subsequent to that. It's like, can you do something, please, already, maybe. So, all right, yeah, that's a long-winded answer for Yaroslav Halak. But yeah, Yaro, great, great talent, but he wasn't an elite. He wasn't going to win a Vesna. He wasn't going to win a Hart. Right? He's a good, serviceable one B goaltender in the National Hockey League. Has been for his entire career but he is not Carey Price. So I'm really glad that they didn't trade away Carey because he would have gone, look, he might have gone on to a team and made them a Stanley Cup winner almost instantly. Yeah. Because sure. St. Yeah. Louis was not a bad hockey team, if memory serves me correctly. Mm -hmm. So he could have definitely changed their future if that's where the deal was going to go. But anyhow, I, I that's, one, that's the answer I give all the time. I got one more Carey Price question, and it is, why did Montreal expose him in the expansion draft? Did you have any kind of insight on that? And why didn't Seattle pick him up? Like, that's a weird thing. If you're looking for someone to come in with star power and sell some tickets and some jerseys off the bat, Carey Price seems a little bit more like a lock than Mark Giordano to me. So what's, what's, what's going on in that situation? Like, why was he left exposed? I'm sure they, they didn't expect him to, to, to be, you know, to be claimed because of his cap hit, but still a very weird thing to do for, for the leader of your team, I would think. So, so his wife was very open about this shortly after. She mm -hmm. said... I'm surprised we were not taken. They were ready. Yeah. They were ready to go. Yeah. You ask a question that I don't like to answer, but I will be honest and fruitful in that answer. Because I have to be very respectful here. Because obviously, I think very highly of Carey Price. I've interviewed Carey Price in the past, and I think he's a great guy. And obviously a great talent. But back in the day, when the Kostitsin brothers had a little problem. Carey Price was involved with that problem. And he was already Carey Price. He was already a big name. And when I say a problem, I mean with illicit substances. So that kind of got swept under the rug. Carey, go get your treatment. We're not going to talk about this. And then years later, we have what happens now, right? It's, oh, Carey Price's knee is hurt. He'll be fine in a few weeks. He's going to see the team doctor. No problem. Okay, I can buy that. You know, big playoff run, you know, maybe some cortisone shots, keeping him in the game, what have you. Okay, yeah, I can buy that. Oh, yeah, his, his knee progress isn't nearly what we thought it was. I'm like, sorry, what? Things weren't starting to make sense. And then it was, we're going to leave Carey Price exposed. Okay, something's going on here, right? Because it's not just a knee injury. And then I go to the back of my head. Like I said, I don't really like to focus on what are considered rumors or something that can affect somebody's character. And the story comes out, obviously, well, mental health. And I said, mm, not so sure it's just mental health. I think there's some substance abuse problems going on here. I said this candidly with some friends. I didn't quote it on social media. I didn't talk about it openly because I didn't want to be that guy. What happens last week? Yeah, I checked into substance abuse. I relied on substances to cope with my mental health. So it wasn't just purely mental health struggles. He developed a drug addiction. Now, they haven't said what that was, 
They didn't say if it was what his old vice was or if it's a potential opioid addiction because of the pain that he was feeling throughout his body, the, the demands that the goaltending position plays on it. But I, I outright said to my friends and people that I trusted, I said, this is drugs. This is a problem. And to me, that's why he wasn't picked up is that you have a problem with a player who has substance abuse issues. And what do you do right out of the gate? As you pointed out, hey, here's our star player. Oh, and there's a substance abuse problem. Do you want to keep dealing with that as an organization? Right? Montreal clearly didn't because they left them exposed. And then when it happens, oh, no, no, like his goaltending coach swore up and down. No, it wasn't substance abuse. Right? Bergevin. No, no, no. Has nothing to do with that. What happens about a month later? Yeah, substance abuse. So I think that taints the conversation, unfortunately. I really wish that the Montreal Canadiens and Carey Price had been a little more forthcoming. I understand that there are reasons for privacy and we respect them. Obviously, there's rumors about all kinds of players out there that you try to be respectful of and not talk about. And when I was interviewing players back in the day, I was always respectful of those things. I did not talk about rumors. But these are matters that aren't just rumors. Clearly, it affected how Seattle viewed him as an asset, as a player, as, as a focal point. And like you said, you get Gary Price, you got a star. But you have a star who clearly behind the scenes, guys like Ron Francis and other people knew, it's like, mm, they're not just leaving him exposed because he's got a sore knee. There's just, there's no way. That made no sense whatsoever. You do not leave your biggest talent exposed. And it's, well, it's the, it's the salary. Mm, no, with like a near $90 million cap hit nowadays, 10 million out of that deal. That's, that's not that significant by comparison. So I, I think it's really unfortunate. I really feel as though if there was a little more transparency and honesty, then things might have turned out differently. And I even said this, and this might get me in trouble, and I really hope it doesn't. But, you know, I've been, as you guys have pointed out, you followed my social media feeds, and I'm pretty open about mental health and anxiety and depression. I, something I've been clinically diagnosed with, and I feel very open and confident talking about that. And to initially come out and say it in that light, I felt personally that it was a disservice, right? You can't, you can't come out and just cheapen mental health, right? Since Wade Belak committed suicide, it has, it's, we're, we're pretending as if Wade Belak was yesterday. It's been almost, what, 10 years? I'm terrible with analyzing years, guys, so forgive me if I'm off. But ever since Wade Belak killed himself, right, mental health hasn't been this thing that we're like, shh, don't talk about it, don't talk about it. It's like, no, Wade Belak killed himself. And we've been very open in, in this game ever since then. It was arguably the impetus for, and I'm not going to mention it because I think it's a joke that they get a tax write-off for it, but a big multinational conglomerate puts together this annual campaign about mental health, and it was brought on, arguably, by the suicide of Wade Belak. And so I, I really, again, want to be as respectful as I can, right? Substance abuse is obviously a problem. But to come out and just say that it's mental health and say, no, 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 it wasn't substance abuse. And then a month later, oh, it was substance abuse. It's like, mm, that's not a good look. And that doesn't help people with mental health at all, actually, in my opinion. So I see it as, as an unfortunate set of circumstances. And that Seattle was wise to it saying, I'm sorry, guys, he might be exposed, but you're going to keep that problem, not us. Mm -hmm. And, and I, think, I think that falls under fair comment now when you have Carey Price admitting it was a substance abuse problem. And I think Seattle just knew that and said, no, you guys can, you guys can deal with that as an organization. That's not for us to do right out the gate as an expansion franchise. For sure. Yeah. That's, that's a long winded answer. And it's a serious one. I had to weigh it very, very carefully because yeah. again, we're talking about, we're talking about Carey Price. It's again, somebody I, I respect tremendously as a goaltender. Obviously you try to respect their privacy and you want the best for these people because at the end they are human beings, right? We forget it. They're just extraordinary at a certain skill set. But yeah, and 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 even to follow up a little bit more about it, I didn't have a whole lot of faith with this thing because if you even read a little bit of Theron Fleury's book, he's like, "Come on, the NHL substance abuse program is a joke." He's like, "I just came off a bender last night, just fresh out of this program, and I was still able to suit up and play." So 
the NHL as a whole, I think, still has some ways to go in dealing with substance abuse problems and how they treat their players and how they can help their players. Oh, agreed. I think that's really well said. I think just coming from a Seattle's perspective, too, it's a little bit different when you go get Philip Grubauer for, say, I don't know, we signed for 6.25. You know, do you bring in carry at 10? Like, you know, like, is, is it really worth the problem for 3 million? I think that's how they kind of thought about it. But, uh, Roke, you got anything It's else? just not worth the problem in general. It yeah. really isn't. You don't want that microscope. It's like, hey, we're a new expansion team. Oh, yes. And our starting goaltender is going into rehab. Yeah. It's like the, it's like the Las Vegas Raiders now. You know, we're new in Las Vegas and we've, uh, we've killed someone, you know, seven weeks in. So good start. Not the best look, not the best look. And, and unfortunately, again, I have to state this very clearly. Unfortunately, it's at the feet of Carey Price. It fell at the feet of Carey Price, one of the highest profile athletes in the sport. So you know, that's why I treated it with the caution and respect that that answer merits. But again, a few months ago when this story broke, or about a month or two ago when it broke, I was like, it's not just mental health. If it was just mental health. Seattle had been like, yeah, we're taking them. We're going to help them. No problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. But unfortunately, there's still that stigmatism attached to drug addiction. For sure, yeah. Right? So, and that's prevalent in all sports. I think it's very fair to say that when you hear this guy's got been caught with cocaine, like, look, MMA, John Jones, highest profile athlete in the entire sport, DUI, cocaine possession, and the UFC, like, it was amazing how he didn't get fired. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so you there, there you go. Yeah, I think he's in a regular sport. He definitely does. I'm not saying the UFC is not a regular sport, but different different breed of sport, right? As opposed, and audience and demographic that you're tailoring to. So, absolutely, yeah, that was a dice. Absolutely. You got anything else, buddy? I just want to say, keep your eye on Philip Gustafson. He's going to be coming with fire here with the Ottawa Senators. So get your scouting report on him because if we have, you <laughs> I back, have I to. Want to hear about him. I'm going to have to come up to Belleville if he's ever playing back out in Belleville well, with, with you guys and watch forth. a game with you. Yeah, For he's sure, back yeah. and forth. So with Murray out, he's probably going to play a lot in Ottawa, but. Just, I'm saying, watch him because he's going to be good. All right. I, hey, look, I always appreciate a heads up. I might know a lot of stuff about the position and hockey in general, but hey, if someone wants to tip their cap and send me in a bit of a different direction, I'm more than happy to travel down that road. It's hockey. It's not as if you're forcing me to watch soccer or, sorry, <laughs> football. Although Ted Lasso, by the way, Ted Lasso, great show. Even if you don't like football, yeah. watch that show. It's awesome where, where did, and some of the sickest the flow was that where'd you find the show because it's not on like it's not on canada right it's on a. it's on disney it's sorry it's on apple and there are a couple of streaming apple, services okay. that if you look around you can definitely stream okay i i don't want to get in too much trouble saying anything oh no what's his ip address but yeah okay yeah if you can find a way to stream it great great show and there's a character <laughs> named danny rojas i will put that guy's flow up against any hockey players <laughs> that flow is sick 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 flow world-class lettuce right there boy. I, i'm sure fleming and i have a, a streaming service that might, might fit in hey bud yeah, yeah but, we uh, got a couple but <laughs> anyways bud thanks for coming on today it was awesome it was a ton of fun uh, I mean, it was a we'll pleasure get, we'll get you on again and you can tell us more stories about uh <laughs> oklahoma or whatever <laughs> what the good old Arkansas boys that Arkansas. don't want to play hockey? I like that one. That was good to have me in tears, buddy. But uh, <laughs> oh, it's good to hear from you. And uh, best of luck with all your uh, your goalie training and uh, achieve. What is it? Achieve your goals. No, what achieve achieve your what do goalies have? They don't have goals. They have achieve saves. Your, achieve your saves. And by the way, guys, you've your, given me okay. some cheap pops here and some props. I've got to say that Pay It Forward is a great program. If you haven't heard about it, and these two guys can help you out with the game of hockey and help get you involved because, again, we're coming out of this pandemic where people have had a very hard time getting back into the game. And I'm not talking about it at a AAA level. I'm talking about it at the grassroots level of house league, right? Yeah. Kids yeah. do not pop out of the womb as Connor McDavid, right? Exactly. They come in, they're six, they're seven years old, and – Hockey's been out of sight, out of mind for a lot of Canadians and a lot of new Canadians for that matter. And, you know, it saddens me that the game didn't recover the way that we had all hoped it would. There's still games, there's still hockey, but a program like yours, definitely an asset to anybody in our communities and surroundings. So if you haven't touched base with these guys about pay it forward, do so. Really, because you want to, you want to get involved in the game. These guys are going to try their best to help you out in any way. And so is Stop the Puck. 
which is why we've got this partnership. And every once in a bit, you have me coming on and I can yak about goaltending and hockey with you guys. Yeah, for awesome. sure. So we appreciate the kind words. Uh, we're not, we're not uh, too shy to admit we plug ourselves quite a bit on this podcast, Lonnie, with Bayford Sports. Sports. But uh, we appreciate you coming on. And uh, from the best goalie coach around, anyone that's looking to get their kids into goalie or a goaltending, uh, if you're an adult looking to kind of achieve some more saves, visit Lonnie on his Facebook page, Stop the Puck Goaltending, or check out the website, stpgoaltending.com, uh, to learn about their upcoming clinics. And uh, a proud partner of Pay It Forward Sports and Boot Club Sports. We just want to thank you for coming on, buddy. And uh, we'll have you back, and we'll look forward to that Gustafson report coming up soon. Sounds good to me, guys. Thanks a lot. Take Thanks care, a lot. Bye. Take care, buddy.